12.30 on the dot. And yes, we know in New York. Um, so welcome to our second Bruce Chris study year. And I want to once again, as always, thank Jeff and thank the staff here yeah. at Bruce Chris. Uh, even in the midst of their kitchen woes today, they have still managed to provide something for us, which is awesome. And those of you that have made New Year's resolutions about diets, <laughs> you get a salad, but if you want to cheat a little bit, you got dessert, so it works out great. Um, but anyway, if you're just coming back, if you weren't here last week, we recapped what we did at the end of the year, and we're now starting this week in Genesis chapter 12. Uh, if this is your first time, or if you are just uh, don't know for whatever reason, uh, if you have a Bible, bring it every week, because what we do in this study is just try to look at what Scripture says, and then what the implications are for your larger theology, or your daily walk with the Lord, or any of that stuff is all up, sort of up to you. My goal here, and my desire, and my, my purpose is to be a tour guide through Scripture. To point out things along the way, to give some background that people much smarter than me have taught me that I want to pass on to other people as well. And um, and when there are problems, when there are issues in Scripture that Christians disagree on, we talk about those and we sort of present the different views. Uh, also, what we're going to be doing starting this week, hopefully, is I've got a camera to record the sessions and I'm going to try to put them online on my website each week. So if you miss a week, you can hop on and you can check it out. The, my website, if you don't know, is jmsmith.org. It's really easy to remember, jmsmith.org. And if you put slash blog on the end of it, that's where I'll be posting the videos. So hop on there, take a look, uh, buy some material so that I can eat and keep doing what I do. But uh, I'm glad to be here with you guys. And let's look at Genesis chapter 12. Genesis 12 is, for all intents and purposes, the beginning of the Bible. The beginning of the major part of the Bible. We talked about last week, everything that got us up to Genesis 12 was to prepare us for the main story of how God is going to reach the nations that have gone astray. Genesis 1 through 11 presents the nations. So we have God creating the world, all the families of the earth, and then through this thing called sin that enters into the picture of human rebellion, the nations just sort of spiral down to the depths where it's so bad that God almost wipes the slate clean. But God has been bound, as we said, by some promises that he made way back in Genesis 3. And one of those promises is that his salvation, the way that you have, when I teach on this, I have a nice cool graphic. Uh, you have God and you have the world, the nations, and there's this separation between them. And what God says is, is the thing that's going to bridge the gap and it's going to ultimately overthrow and renew and put right what went wrong in the garden is going to happen through the offspring of the woman, the seed of the woman. A human being is going to be the one that puts it right. So Genesis 12 then gives us the first calling of the line of this promise that God made to put the world right and to bring back the nations of the earth to him. And it's right here in the first verses. Look at Genesis 12, verse 1. Uh, whatever translation you're reading from, today I'm reading from the Holman Christian Standard Version, but uh, whatever you have is fine. Just listen to what God says to Abram. The Lord said to Abram, go out from your land, your relatives, and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And I will curse those who treat you with contempt. Or some translations say, I will curse those who curse you. And all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. Now, this is the beginning of the Abrahamic promise. That later in Genesis 15 will be ratified into the Abrahamic covenant. This is the promise God makes to Abram. One of the descendants of Shem. One of the sons of Noah. One of the offspring of of the woman. God is carrying on his plan of reaching the world, and he's going to do it right here is the initial beginning of it. When what will, will basically, this is the seed that will blossom into the full tree of the rest of the Old Testament. This is the beginning of the people of Israel, as we'll know it, who in turn are uh, standing in for or serving as God's representation 
to reach the entire world. So here we have God calling Abram and he gives him, he, he, he makes seven promises to Abram. What are they? Look at it. This is where I want you to, I want to take a microscope to this. That he, he makes seven promises, seven things he says he's going to do. The condition is, Abram, you go and go to the land that I will show you. All right. That's the, the condition. Now, at this time, and, and this again, if I, we were in a classroom, I have a map. But Abram is either, he's in one of two places right now. He's either in Babylon, like modern day Iraq, down in the Fertile Crescent area, which would be sort of down here. Israel would be here. Turkey would be up here. Right? This is, just pretend there's a visible map here. Maybe I can add it on the video or something. So he's either down here in Babylon, or he may be up in this place called Ur of the Chaldeans, which could be a little bit north, maybe sort of near the mountains of Ararat, somewhere up in the air. He's one of two places. It doesn't matter because he's called to leave that and go all the way over to what will eventually be this place called Canaan, this promised land. But right now he's, he's over here somewhere. And this is before airplanes, before train rides, before checked baggage, before any of that. This is a long and dangerous journey. And Abram's, he's not traveling light. He would have baggage fees a lot. He has a lot of people. He has a lot of goods. He's a rich man. He's very rich. The only thing that he's missing, the only thing he's lacking is the one thing that was considered the biggest blessing of all in the ancient Near East. Someone to carry on your family name. He and his wife are childless. And they're in their 70s. He's 75. She's maybe 60, 65, somewhere in there. So they're not spring chickens. They're, they're getting up there. And he's legitimately, that's a legitimate concern of his. But here, God says, go from everything you know to the land that I'll show you. And if you do that, seven things are going to happen. What are they? What's the first thing he says? It's not a trick question. It's right here, verse 2. Okay. I will make you into a great nation. I will make you into a great nation. All right? The first promise, which is odd because right now he's just one guy. He's got some land and some people, but... He's, he's, he's just a person. Then you have a kid. I can't even become a nation. But God says, I'll make you into a great nation. What's the second one? I will bless you. And that's more than like when you sneeze. Bless you. Like this is, I will bless you. I will prosper you. Not just materially, but spiritually as well. It, it's, there's not a great English equivalent of what it means to bless. What's the third thing? I will make your name great. In other words, little kids on another continent thousands of years later will spin around and do their hands up and down and sing about you, Father Abraham, for those of you that don't know the song. Uh, go to vacation Bible school and you learn Father Abraham have many sons. So, I will make your name great. What's the fourth one? You will be a blessing. I'm going to extend what I want to do to you to the people around you. You'll be a vessel, Abram. This is not just about giving. It's not just about blessing. It's not just prayer of Jabez. Gimme, gimme, gimme. This is, I'm going to work through you. What's the fifth one? Uh, I will bless those who bless you. Alright, so Abram, as you're going around in this unknown land, I will, the people that bless you, the people that treat you well, I'll treat them well. The, the way they treat you will be a reflection of my relationship with them. What's the sixth one? And I will curse those who curse you or treat you badly. Or Basically, these last two are God saying, I've got your back. I will be your protector. I will be your shield. He'll actually specifically say that in Genesis 15. This is a promise. He's, he's basically saying, Abraham, all of the concerns that you would have that you could raise to me in order to not go, I'm, I'm taking care of those. I'm taking care of those. And then the last one, the seventh one. Seven being always an interesting number in Scripture, the representing or, or pointing towards the fullness, the completeness. In this case, the purpose of all of it is what? In you, or through you, or by you, however you want to translate it, the Hebrew can go either way, all the nations of the world will be blessed. Now, that is the purpose of the call of Abram. The purpose of the call of Abram is to reach the nations. If we ever forget that, we go astray of Scripture and we end up into this, uh, this Hebrew nationalism that plagued Israel throughout the rest of their days. Because by the time of Jesus, Israel had become inwardly focused and thought that they were blessed in order to be blessed. And Jesus comes along and says, no, the purpose has always been 
outward. The purpose has always been the nations. I wrote an article on the website, why did Jesus get mad when the money changers were in the temple? Is it because they were cheating people? Well, we don't really have any evidence of that. But it's because they were set up in the one place in the temple where Gentiles were allowed to go worship the one true God. And, and because the money changers were going on there, Gentiles couldn't do that. And Jesus was saying, my father's house will be a house of prayer for the nations. You're turning it into a den of brigands and robbers and insurgents. So all throughout scripture, the whole book of Jonah will be written specifically to emphasize this point. Jonah will have missed it. Jonah's the bad guy, by the way. It's the only book of the Bible named after the bad guy. He's not the hero. Uh, Jonah's the bad guy. And Jonah has this view of Israel being a blessing. And, and the whole, I'll bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. Jonah's big on that. And God does this whole thing with Jonah to show him, no, Jonah, I want to bless even the evil Assyrians through Israel, through you, through my people. And we'll find out later how it unfolds. But the Abrahamic promise... It's not a covenant yet. It's a promise. It is a promise for God to reach the nations, the world. The point has always been the Gentiles and the Jews, everybody. When people talk about Israel being God's chosen people, what are they chosen for? That's the question that should always be asked. What were they chosen for? Because Deuteronomy, Moses will be blatantly clear about it. He'll say, God didn't choose you just because he likes you. He didn't choose you because you're a great nation. He didn't choose you because you're better than anybody else. He chose you because he made a promise to your ancestor, Abel, that he was going to do something through you. And you are the apple of his eye because you are the, the, the fulcrum on which all history is going to pivot. You are the people that he's calling to be the blessing to the world. That's the thrust of the entire Old Covenant. And it's something that when, when this passage gets quoted in a lot of popular, especially I wrote a book called You Want to Be Left Behind that's about popular end times teachings. And one of the most popular end times teachings, and I'll be actually debating a good friend of mine on this in April, Gordon Conwell, uh, my friend Dr. Michael Brown, who's here in Charlotte. Uh, wonderful guy, great friends, Messianic believer. He and I probably see eye to eye on 90% of the world. But one of the things where we differ is the current attitudes that Christians have towards Israel, modern Israel. And, and regardless of your view on it, the, this verse gets appealed to a lot. If you listen to John Hagee for two seconds, he's going to mention this as well. If you hear anything about Israel and the land and the Palestinians, then people inevitably go back to Genesis 12 and they'll say, I'll bless those who bless you and those who curse you, I'll curse America. We need to give Israel the support. We need to stand with them or God's going to crush us as a nation. Well, regardless of whether or not that's true, that is nowhere in this verse. This is a promise to Abram's family and to Abram's line of descendants. Not all of them. He's going to have descendants that aren't heirs to this blessing. But to the promised line that will become later in the book of Exodus, the people of Israel at Mount Sinai. The promise is, I'm going to protect you and I'm going to take care of you and I'm going to provide for your needs. If you follow me, the conditional part will come later, especially in Exodus. And if you obey me in covenant. But the purpose is to reach and bless the nations. That's the purpose. Insofar as you're not reaching and blessing the nations, I am not obligated to pour out my blessings on you. God will repeat that over and over and over. The prophets will repeat that over and over. Israel's purpose was always beyond itself. Israel was the vehicle, the instrument through which God would reach the nations. Israel was part of humanity. They were part of the nations that had gone astray. But God is going to pull them out of obscurity, create them into a nation, and then use that nation to reach the world. The problem that's going to arise in the Old Testament, though, is that nation immediately is going to start disobeying. And they're just going to start zigging when God wants them to zag. They're going to start worshiping other gods or worshiping God, but also bringing in other gods on the side just to hedge their bets. All of this is going to happen over the centuries. And then God's going to send prophet after prophet after prophet to tell him, this is my plan, this is my purpose. And it's going to get to a point where God's going to say through two of the prophets, through Isaiah, excuse me, through Jeremiah and Ezekiel, he's going to say, look, I'm still going to carry out my promise to bless you and reach the nations, but it's not going to come through you as a nation anymore. I'm going to actually do something new. I'm going to make a new covenant. I'm going to put my law out on tablets. I'm going to put it on your hearts. 
And then lo and behold, in the New Testament, Jesus comes along and starts saying things that only God can say, doing things that only God can do. And Jesus starts to make claims like those who follow him are the true seed of Abraham. Jesus will flat out tell the Jewish leaders of his day who could who would definitely stand on this as their heritage. He'll say, no, God can raise up sons of Abraham from these rocks. You're, you're children of your father, the devil, because you're opposing me. Now, he's saying this to some, not all, but some Jewish leaders. That takes chutzpah. That takes uh, <laughs> serious confidence. But he can say that because the seed of Abraham, the offspring of Abraham, who is the seed of the woman, the offspring of the woman, is going to come, we're going to find out in the New Testament, that it ends up being Jesus. Himself, not the church, not Israel, but Jesus as the Israelite, the true seed of Abram. Paul made this crystal clear in Galatians. He'll even use a, a Hebrew wordplay notion of the word seed and how it can be a singular and a plural. And Jesus is both the singular and his people. And it'll have massive implications for what you think about of yourself as the people of God. How can you be, how can you worship Jesus and be in Jesus if Jesus is just a person? Well, if he's a person, you can worship him. If he is the people of God, you can be in him just like you could be in Israel in the Old Testament. You enter into this corporate reality, this corporate solidarity. So this promise to Abram is crucial. It's foundational. This is, this is the charter for the rest of the Old Testament. This is the, if you're a highlighter, highlight this passage. Have this in your memory banks of, of important high points in Scripture, mountain peaks in Scripture. This is one of them. This is the foundation. Everything that's going to come after in the Old Testament is going to be, and especially in Genesis, is going to be how's God going to fulfill this promise? That's the question that Genesis is going to make you wrestle with. And it's going to start in the very next section of this. How is God going to keep these promises? There's going to be some tension. The rest of Genesis is going to unfold it. But look, verse 4. So Abram went, as the Lord told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he left Haran, where he was staying, sort of up in close to the north of Israel. All the possessions they accumulated and the people they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan. Canaan is the land of Israel. Now remember, Canaan, those of you that have been here, that should raise a red flag. Canaan, I know the land of Canaan. I know about Canaan. Canaan was the one who Noah cursed because Canaan's dad did something really wrong to Noah. And Noah predicted or prophesied or, or spoke that Canaan would end up being somewhat like his dad and the Canaanites. Would. So in other words, whatever the implications, Canaan should be like, oh, that's, that's not the godliest of places. But that's what God promises what he's going to give to Abram. Abram passed through the land to the site of Shechem at the Oak of Moreh at the time the Canaanites were in the land. Verse 7, but the Lord appeared to Abram and said, I'll give this land to your offspring or your seed. That term is crucial and it will be repeated all throughout scripture. I will give this land to your seed. So Abram built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there, he moved on to the hill country east of Bethel and pitched his tent. With Bethel on the east and I on the west. Excuse me, Bethel on the west and I on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and worshipped him. So in stages, Abram's moving, he's building an altar, he's worshiping. He doesn't own the land, it's not his possession, the Canaanites are in the land, he's a sojourner, he's an alien, he's a traveler, but he's building an altar, build an altar, worship the Lord, worship the Lord, and then, verse 9, then Abram journeyed by stages to the Negev, down to the southern wilderness, down to the desert. Abram, now, now for us, these place names don't really mean much, but they're important. Because we're going to see them a lot in the history of Israel. These three particular places that are mentioned, Shechem, the place between Bethel and Ai, and then down into the Negev. Later, Abram's offspring, his grandson, Jacob, is going to make this same journey. And he's going to encounter God or have experience or significant experiences at these three places. And then even later, when Jacob gets a name changed to Israel, when his offspring are now thousands under Joshua, tens of thousands, maybe even millions, some say, they're going to enter into the promised land and they're going to actually go to these places 
And there's going to be significant events between them and the Lord in terms of worship. Well, Abram is, is prophetically or typologically walking the place, the journey that Jacob, Israel is going to go. He's, he's sort of setting out or staking claim to the land through faith that his inheritance, his descendants will inherit centuries later, like 400 years later. Okay? But it's right here in Genesis. This is where he's going. This is what he's doing. And the reader, these names should tuck them away and go, oh, okay, we may see these again. Very few things in Scripture are just completely random. And in this, what we have is Abram sort of embodying his descendants. And so these places will be significant. However, as he's going through the land, here's where things sort of take a turn. Verse 10. Now there was a famine in the land. All the ovens weren't working. So they didn't even have salad. It was, I mean, they didn't even have near the feast. This is a feast. All right. There was, a, there was a famine in the land. So Abram went down to Egypt to live there for a while because of the famine in the land being so severe. Now later, his descendants are going to also go down into Egypt because of the famine during the time of Joseph, at the end of Genesis. Abram's life will be recapitulated in his offspring's life. Verse 11, when he was about to enter Egypt, he said to his wife Sarai, look, or time out, hold on. I know what a beautiful woman you are. In Hebrew, it's more emphatic. Like, I know you are really good looking. Which every wife would like to hear their husband say that. When the Egyptians see you, they'll say, this is his wife, and they'll kill me and let you live. So please say you're my sister, so it'll go well for me because of you. And my life will be spared because of you on your account. When Abram entered Egypt, the Egyptians saw that the woman, his wife, was very beautiful. Exceedingly good looking, I think is the literal Hebrew. Uh, Pharaoh's officials saw her and praised her to Pharaoh. So the woman was taken to Pharaoh's house. Palace is his Taking this out, she didn't go to visit. Like, this is, hey, I'm Pharaoh. I'm a god, basically. I like what I see. You're coming with me. This is what's going on. Pharaoh's official saw her, praised her. Uh, she was taken to Pharaoh's house. Verse 16. He, and he treated Abram well because of her. And Abram acquired flocks and herds, male and female donkeys, male and female slaves and camels. So everything's seemingly going well. There's a famine. They leave their famine-struck land that Abram doesn't really own anything anyway. And they go to this land, Egypt, away from the land that God had told them to go to. And while they're in Egypt, Abram says, in seemingly not remembering the, I'll bless those who bless you, I'll curse those who curse you, hey, I need to, we need to make sure that some things are protected first. Uh, Sarai, you're, you're a hobby. And they're going to see that. And they're going to want you. And uh, they're going to kill me to get you. But if they think I'm your brother, then they won't kill me because that would anger you and that would make you have this. They'll, they'll butter you up by treating me well, right? Like if you're a guy and you're wanting to date a girl, you, you're good to the family, you're good to her friends, then that gets you some credit in her eyes. So that's what he's thinking. Uh, and it's not technically a lie. She is his half-sister. She she's technically his sister, especially in Hebrew, the word can have a wider range than just your immediate sister. So he's, he's sort of... He's not lying, but he's not being truthful. And he's allowing the promise to be jeopardized. Because God was going to make a nation through him. And he's married to Sarah. That's Sarai at this point. And the, the, the blessing and all that's supposed to come through them. Well, here, things end up in a great form. To save his own skin and to, to you know, protect him. He says, all right, you know, they can have the wife. And then in return, he got a bunch of stuff. He got all kinds of wealth. He, he got paid well. Indecent proposal type thing. Like he, he made off pretty good. So, but that's the first note, note of tension that Genesis is going to play out. The problem, problem is this puts the promise that God made in jeopardy. And God's not going to allow that. So what, what does God do? Verse 17. But the Lord struck Pharaoh and his house <coughs> with severe afflictions or plagues. Because of Abram's wife, Sarai. So Pharaoh sent for Abram and said, What have you done to me? Why didn't you tell me she was your wife? Why did you say she was my sister? So I took her as my wife. Now, here's your wife. Take her and go. <laughs> then Pharaoh gave his men orders about him, and they sent him away with his wife and all he had. Now, here's the, here's the very interesting prototypical point here. Even in his 
you don't want to say full on disobedience, but his 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 bad decision making at the very least. God still made it so that divinely and supernaturally his promise would go forward. In other words, if Abram's not going to be honest to Pharaoh, God's going to be honest to Pharaoh. And God's going to see that Abram and Sarai get back to Canaan. And here's the uh, interesting part. And God even, Abram even leaves blessed. He even leaves with more than he came. Throughout that, God's going to be extravagant throughout Genesis in his, in his generosity. Even when people screw up time and time again when they mess up. This is going to be, this is, Abram's life in this section is a microcosm of Israel's life later in Exodus. They're going to, Israel's going to do the same thing. They're going to be in Egypt, they're going to be afflicted, or they're going to be uh, taken advantage of or punished or whatever. And God's going to afflict another Pharaoh with plagues. And through that, Israel is going to be set out. Take your woman and go. It's going to be take your millions or hundreds of thousands and go. And they're going to come out with all of this wealth that the Egyptians are going to give them to leave. And they're going to come out with a mixed multitude of Egyptians who see all of this and go, your God is the real deal. I want in on it. So from the beginning, Israel is going to be this multi-ethnic people that are all centered around faith in God. And, it, and it's all in seed form here in Abram. His life is going to play out. It's going to recapitulate. It's going to be typological is the theological word for it. It's where one earlier event prefigures in some way a later event. So we see this here in Abram. His life is wandering. Now the key things, there's a couple of things that get overlooked with the story of Abram. And we're going to be done in a couple of minutes here. One thing that gets overlooked, God appeared to Abram once in this chapter. He won't appear to Abram again for possibly ten more years. And by the time Abram has his first son, the promised son, it will be 25 years after God first appeared and made the promise. Abram is going to be tested in terms of his timetable. And God's going to make a promise to Abram in chapter 15 that blows his mind. He's going to say, yeah, what I'm going to do is 400 years away. I'm working on a time scale bigger than you, Abram. And, and that's sort of, in many ways, prototypical of how God works in a lot of people's lives and in our lives. God may make a promise, and it may be 10, 15 years before you hear from him again. And you may think, okay, well, I haven't heard from God in a while. Maybe I need to sort of help God. Abram and Sarai are going to do it in the next chapter. They're going to try to help him out. Um, you know, maybe, maybe I need to make some provision when I go down to Egypt to spare my life, to take care of me. Forgetting the promise that God had made. Abram does this. Abram's very human. He, he, his struggles are our struggles, even though he's, you know, 4,000 years ago in a completely different culture. There's a lot of overlap, a lot of similarity. The other thing worth mentioning, I think it's funny, is, um, is Sarai, who will become Sarah, she must have been like the Raquel Welch of the ancient Near East. Like, I saw a picture of Raquel Welch, and she's like 70-something and is still gorgeous. Same thing with Sarai, because later, Years later, years later, after she's in, she's close to in her 80s and 90s, there's going to be another king, a king called the Abimelech, and he's going to actually do the same kind of thing. <laughs> so Sarai's got it going on well into her later years. Um, but that's what's, what, one of the things that's interesting about this is this starts when Abram and Sarai are in what we would call today retirement age. It just begins then. Same thing with Moses. I mean, Moses will sort of start things when he's maybe in his 80s. God's timetable is bigger, and, and he's working. And, and this is after the time where people live hundreds and hundreds of years. I mean, Abram lives kind of long. Sarai lives 120-something. But people today still live that long in some parts of the world. So it, God, even when things look improbable, or when the rest of the culture would say, yeah, you're done, kick back, retire, you got all your servants, you got all this, you got all that, you know, Go play shuffleboard in the desert or do whatever you want to do. Uh, just relax. And that's when God calls Abram and says, no, I want you to go.